So we got to the end of Mark chapter 10. And we saw in that great verse that Jesus said that he who is the great one came not to be served, but to lose his life in this world in order that we may save our lives in the next world. He came to give his life as a ransom for us. And we saw how Jesus had opened his disciples' eyes, not only to see who he is, but also to grasp what it means to walk the way of the cross, what it means that he has come to do for us. And I was saying that in chapter 11, verse 1, he then goes into Jerusalem uh, to go to that death. And it's that death that we're going to concentrate on now by looking at chapter 14 through to the end of the gospel. So chapter 14, verse 1, is where we're going to start. And we're introduced, first of all, to two paragraphs, two chunks of the gospel, uh, which are on this theme. It introduces the death of Jesus. We're very close to the moment where Jesus will die. And first of all, we're told that this death of Jesus is to be forever remembered. Chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. Now, if you look down to this passage, if you've got a Bible like mine, it's divided into bits with some headings on top. So you've got verses 1 and 2, and then you've got verses 3 to 9, and then you've got verses 2 and 11. This is a bit like a sandwich. Now, sandwiches are not things that you have a lot in Uganda. Uh, there was a, somebody from Uganda who came over to London to do the Cornhill training course, the course that I run. And when he first arrived, we had a welcome lunch for people who'd come from overseas to, uh, to join us. His name is Joseph Matovu. Some of you will know him. So... Uh, Joseph came to this lunch that we put on, and we gave them uh, sandwiches. And Joseph, this is the first time he's been into the Cornhill training course building. He's offered his lunch of a sandwich. And he picks this up, and he says, what is this? <laughs> it's a sandwich, Joseph. You eat it. This is not food. <laughs> A sandwich has bread, something in the middle, bread underneath, of course. And that's what we've got here. We've got a bit at the beginning that is very like the bit at the end and another bit in the middle. So if you look at the way Mark puts this verses 1 to 11 together, you can see that he's sort of wrapping the stories around one another. So verses 1 and 2 are telling us about how the chief priests and the scribes are wanting to arrest Jesus secretly by stealth and kill him. And in verses 10 and 11, Judas comes and provides them with the opportunity. He says, I can help you with that. And he then is going to help them see that Jesus is arrested and killed. And he goes out in verse 11 looking for his opportunity now to betray Jesus so that Jesus can go to his death. So the bit at the beginning and the bit at the end, the, the bread and the bread in my sandwich, are about this plot to see Jesus go to his death. And in the middle, we have the story of this woman in verses 3 to 9. And she does this extraordinarily costly thing. She did a once-in-a-lifetime thing. She broke a bottle. In the first century in this country, bottles were not like ours with a screw-top lid. They were made of clay and completely sealed. So the only way of getting the liquid out was to smash to break the whole thing. It's like cracking an egg. You have to kind of crack it to open it. So once it's out, you, you can't have some of it. It's all of it or nothing. And she comes with this very expensive perfume 
and she breaks the bottle, the perfume comes out. And we're told in verse 8, look down to verse 8, that she did what she could. She has done what she could. She used what she had and she extravagantly poured out her love for Jesus. And if you've heard uh, sermons on this passage, the pastor has probably said something like this, are you willing to do something extravagant for Jesus? But I don't think that's what this passage is about. Of course, it's about her love, and it is about her extravagant love, but it's much more about Jesus and his death. One of the things I I said yesterday was how the book of Mark is about Jesus. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? It's Jesus. It's always about Jesus. But we so often, don't we, go to the stories in the Gospels. We go to the stories in Mark, and we're so quick to ask, what does this mean for me? And of course, every bit of the Bible does have implications for us. But we must be careful and not simply say, this is what somebody did, this is what I must do. We must first understand properly what we're being told. And I know that a lot of the verses that we were looking at yesterday about the amazing things that Jesus did, many people would go to those verses and say, that's the reason why we should do amazing things. Jesus healed people. Jesus cast out demons. Look what Jesus did. We must do the same. Now, of course, God can still do miracles today. Of course he can. He hasn't lost his power and his might. But we can't say just because Jesus did something in the Bible, we should do it. We've got to be very careful of jumping from what somebody in the Bible did to think that we should do it. David committed adultery. I don't think the Bible is saying to us, you should go and find a beautiful woman who's having a bath and take her into your bed. If any of the boys were thinking that is what that story means, come and have a talk to me afterwards. It doesn't mean that. So we've got to be careful. We must first of all say, what is this really telling us? And Mark is telling us about Jesus. Uh, It's worth knowing you are not in the Bible. Now, the Bible is about God and what he's doing. The Bible is about Jesus. It's not about you. It is for you, it is for us, but it's not about us. And all that Mark's gospel is telling us much more about Jesus, and from that comes implications for us. But it mustn't jump straight from the stories to us. So here is the woman who did this extravagant thing, but I think this is telling us something much more about Jesus than it is saying you should go and do something extravagant like her. Look down again to verse 8, because I think this explains what this story is really about. This, This kind of expensive perfume would be part of what you would use if somebody had died and you were preparing the body to be buried. You would cover it in expensive perfume. And Jesus is saying, she has covered my body in that expensive perfume but she's done it before I'm dead. (laughs) She has done what you would do if you wanted to honor a loved one from your family who has died. If your mother had died, if your brother had died, then you would find your expensive perfume and put it all over the body. And Jesus is saying, this woman has done that for me. What she has done is anointed my body for death, for burial, before I've died. So the thing that she has done that is being held up as a wonderful thing is she has honored the death of Jesus. She has said the death of Jesus is a very, very precious thing to me. So now put these stories together in my sandwich. And you'll see that the whole of verses 1 to 11 is about the death of Jesus. Both are looking ahead 
to his death, anticipating his death. One story is all about making that death happen. Chief priests, the scribes, Judas, plotting together. We're going to bring about the death of Jesus. And the other story in the middle is about a lady who is honoring that death of Jesus. It's a precious thing. One lot are saying, we hate Jesus so much we want to kill him. And the other lady is saying, I love Jesus so much I want to treat him as precious in his death. Now, and that contrast is explained in verse 9. Look down to this, where Jesus says, I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Uh, how is it that what she has done will be told wherever the gospel is proclaimed. In other words, this is saying, isn't it, you've not preached the gospel unless you've told this story. There might be people who think you've explained what it means to follow the Lord Jesus, what the gospel is. And this verse seems to say, unless you mention this lady, you haven't done it. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, what this woman has done will be told. Is that right? Put your hand up if every time you have told the gospel to somebody or you thought you've told the gospel, you have mentioned this lady. Anybody here? No, I thought not. I think it, what it's saying is you don't have to tell the story of this woman to tell the story of this woman. Does that sound complicated? You don't have to tell the story of this woman to tell the story of this woman. Because from now on, wherever the gospel is preached and we tell people about the death of Jesus, we will always be saying, what will you do about the death of Jesus? What do you think of the death of Jesus? Do you hate Jesus so much that you want to see him out of your life and forgotten and dead? Or do you love the death of Jesus so much that you want to honor it? It's a very good way, isn't it, of telling the gospel. Here is the death of Jesus for you. What do you think of it? Do you think, I'm glad he's dead because he can't come and interfere in my life? Or do you think, that is a precious thing that he's done for me, and I honor him for that death? Now, if you're a Christian here today, you'll be thinking, I'm, I'm like this woman. I haven't got any perfume. <laughs> But I love the death of Jesus for me. I honor him for that death. So that's the first story then. The death of Jesus is forever remembered. The second bit of the story, uh, the, the second story is verses 12 to 26. And I think this is exactly the same. It's all about the death of Jesus that is forever to be remembered. And what we're going to get here in this story is a Passover meal. Think back several days. We were looking, weren't we, at Exodus chapter 12. A lamb was to be killed. Blood was to be painted on the door. And God, the destroyer, would pass over your house because a substitute had been killed. Blood had been shed. A death had happened. And so you were saved. And ever since that time, every year, every year, Jews gather as a family and eat lamb and remind each other of that first event in Egypt when the Lord passed over. It's called the Passover meal. And every time they have that meal, one of the family round the table, the son, says... Why are we doing this meal today, Daddy? And the dad explains to the family, this is all to remember what happened. Right on that first Passover night, a lamb was killed so that the rest of the family, the eldest son, were safe. A substitute was killed. And so we remember that, that God saved us 
when a lamb was killed. So this meat that we're eating, my family, this reminds us of that Passover lamb that was killed. Now, to see what happens here in this story, Jesus goes to great lengths to make sure that he's going to be sitting down to eat this Passover meal with his disciples. So verses 12 to 16, he sends the disciples out and gives them lots of instructions. And you've got to go down that road, take the second turning on the left. When you get to the house at the end, turn around the corner that way. Then there's a muddy bit. Then you'll meet a, meet a man who's wearing a hat and one sock and ask him if he's got a car. And he will say no, but his wife has got a car. So go to the wife and say, can I have the keys? And she will say yes, and you can take the key. It's that kind of arrangement. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I've got it all sorted out because I want to eat this Passover meal with you, my disciples. And so they get down and they sit together, verse 18, and they're eating this food to one another, with one another. And verse 22, as they were eating, he took the bread and he took the wine. And for years and years, every one of his disciples has sat around the table with their family. And somebody would have said in the family, what does this mean? And the father would say, this meal reminds us of that back then that happened when God saved us out of Egypt. This reminds us of that. And Jesus, being like the dad at the family, takes it and says, this is all to remind us of. And he doesn't say that. He says, me. He is saying, can you, can you imagine what it's like? I don't know what, you would, what in your family would be the most traditional meal where you get together as a whole family and you have things that you always do as a family. For our family, it's Christmas lunch. The whole family comes together and there are things that we always have to do. If, if we changed any one of them, everybody in the family would say, no, 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 you can't do that. At Christmas, we always do a certain thing. So we give each other presents. But you can't open your presents until after a certain thing in the day. And maybe you have a meal like that in your family. Passover is like that. We always get together. The dad takes the stuff and he says, this reminds us of that. And Jesus takes it and says, this is about me and my death for you. From now on, the Passover is to be a meal, not about the exodus, but about the death of Jesus. Not about the lamb that was killed back in the book of Exodus, but the Lord Jesus, the perfect lamb, the one without blemish, um, whose blood was shed for us. So those verses that we were looking at earlier in this week from Exodus help us to see that Jesus is saying that Passover is now about me. This meal is now about me. So both of these first bits in Mark chapter 14 are saying the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus. Don't forget it. Wherever the gospel is preached, what this woman has done the challenge of how you will respond to the death of Jesus will be preached. Whenever the church gets together and you break bread and share wine, you have the Lord's Supper, remember the death of Jesus. Always remember the death of Jesus. And what we're doing is setting up what Mark is doing as he tells us this story, is saying Jesus' death is central to everything. It's right at the heart of all that we believe. And so we come now from chapter five, uh, 14, verse uh, 26 or so onwards to the story of the arrest, the betrayal, the rejection, the killing of Jesus. And that's what we're going to think about now. But I want you just to come on to chapter 15, verse 24. 15, 24, and see where the story is taking us. And it takes us to the cross. And chapter 15, verse 24 Look how simply 
Mark tells us what happened. There they crucified him. That's it. Many preachers today like to go on and on about how um, bloody it was. They talk about nails being driven into the hands and blood spurting and about whips taking out lumps of flesh on somebody's back and pushing a crown of thorns on Jesus' head and making his head bleed. And we like the stories that make us it make it seem more physical. But Mark doesn't concentrate on any of that. He just plays it down and says, what you need to know is they crucified him. His focus is not on the blood and the, the kind of bits of flesh. Jesus was crucified. Now, I want to suggest that all the way through chapter 14 and 15, there is a big theme, and the big theme that takes us to the cross is that Jesus is forsaken. Jesus is abandoned. He will give up on Jesus, leave him. Jesus is forsaken. First of all, Jesus is forsaken by his friends, by his disciples, those who said they were going to be with him. And do you remember back in chapter 3 when Jesus chose 12 up a mountain, the 12 up a mountain, he said that they were to be with him. And here we are in chapter 14, and what we discover is that one after another, they are all scattered. They all fall away. Of course, there's Judas. He's number one. He betrays Jesus. He abandons Jesus. Think about Peter and James and John. Look down to verse 37 and 38, where they are in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they can't even stay awake. They give up on Jesus by falling asleep. A word to anybody who's falling asleep now. Stop it! <laughs> Wake up! Um, uh, look at verse 50. We're told in verse 50, they all left him and fled. In verse 51 and 52, we get a strange story of this young man who runs away naked. Somebody else who abandoned Jesus. Some people think that maybe this is Mark saying, talking about himself here. The young man is Mark. And Mark is saying, I was there, but I also left Jesus. I was no different. I ran away too. And even Peter, remember this is Peter who said, you are the Christ. Peter. Peter, who in chapter 14, verse 31, look down to this, who says, I'm never going to deny you. I'll never abandon you. He denies Jesus, even him, once, twice, three times. He forsakes Jesus. He abandons him. It is desperate through Mark chapter 14 that one by one, all of Jesus' friends abandon him. Now, you might feel how hard this must have been for Jesus, his friends abandoning him. But all the way through, we kept getting told this is exactly what Scripture said. They abandoned him, just as Scripture said. They were scattered, just as Scripture said. They forsook him, just as Scripture said. It was all known by Jesus that the ones he chose, he had made sure it was written down in the Bible hundreds of years before. That these would be the very ones who would forsake him. It's all being fulfilled. Secondly, Jesus is forsaken by his foes, his enemies. And a bit like the Passover lamb that Jesus now is, he is led as a lamb to the slaughter. That's how Isaiah 53 talks about him. And it says that as a lamb is led to the slaughter, as Jesus is led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. 
And all the way through the trial in chapter 14 and 15, Jesus hardly says a word. It's all things that are said to Jesus. Apart from one very significant moment, look down to verse 62. Chapter 14, verse 62. Where the high priest, this is a, a trial. Imagine what it's like. You've got all the, all the important people in society are all there f- sitting on their white plastic chairs watching. You've got the high priest here with all his power. He's got a platform, probably a throne. And in front of him is Jesus. And everybody is making accusations against Jesus. And the high priest says, can't you hear what everybody's saying? Tell me, are you the Christ? Remember, of course, that is exactly what Peter has declared back at chapter 8. Are you the Christ? And Jesus, verse 62, says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man. The Son of Man is how Jesus speaks about himself. So you will see me seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So here is Jesus, blindfolded, spat at, punched, beaten, Who is powerful in that scene? The high priest. Who is weak-looking and pathetic? Jesus. Are you the Christ? And Jesus says, verse 62, and you see what he does in that moment. He turns the whole scene upside down. And he says, there is a day coming when you, high priest, will see me, who looks so small and weak and insignificant, And you will see me, what does it say? Coming with or on the clouds of heaven. Jesus will ride clouds like you ride a motorbike. He will come on clouds. You, high priest, will see Jesus, the one who will be judge of all. So it's a kind of completely turning it around. I look pathetic, you look powerful. But there will be a day when you will be being judged as I, the Lord Jesus, has seen to be the great one. But throughout this chapter, throughout this section, all of Jesus' enemies are concerned to see him taken to his death. He's forsaken by his enemies, of course. They hate him. I just want to point us to one story, the very famous story in verses 6 to 15, which is the story of Barabbas. You'll know this story well. Look at verse 7. The one thing we know about Barabbas is he's guilty. He's committed murder. That's what we know. And the one thing we know about Jesus, look down to verse 14, Pilate says this, is that Jesus is innocent. So you've got a definite guilty man and you've got a definite innocent man. But look at the chief priests in verse 10 who have brought this innocent man, Jesus, to the court out of envy. They don't like him having all this, claiming all this power. Authority. They don't like him having crowds. And the crowd, verse 11, are stirred up. So the crowd all around are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And verse 15, all Pilate wants to do is keep everybody happy. He wants to satisfy the crowd. All of that works together. And what happens is the innocent man goes to his death. And the guilty man is set free. Jesus is crucified and Barabbas is untied. And I want you to see that in this little story, we've got again the story of substitution. Instead of the guilty man dying, the innocent man takes his place and dies. In fact, it is technical theological word, penal substitution. Penal means punishment. So it is punishment substitution. So Barabbas is punished, sorry, Jesus is punished 
when Barabbas should be punished as a substitute, penal substitute. So the innocent man is substituted and he takes the guilty man's place and dies. Now look, put these two points together. Jesus is forsaken by his friends. Jesus is forsaken by his foes. That covers the whole world. People who like him, people who hate him. And what Mark is saying is everybody abandoned Jesus. He was forsaken by everybody. You can be as close to Jesus as the disciples were, but that doesn't stop you joining in with everybody else. And what the world does when confronted with the king of the world is say, let's kill him. And you may think that that is awful, but there's a final forsaken, and this is the, the most awful of all, and yet the most wonderful of all. And we're going to, for our last uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just look at this last paragraph, verses 33 to 39. Let me read it to us, and let's see how this story comes to its climax as Jesus is forsaken, not just by his friends, not just by his enemies, but also by his father. Chapter 15, verse 33. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. And remember, this is like chapter 8, where Peter says, you are the Christ. And it's anticipated in the very first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ, the son of God. Now, this little paragraph is very carefully put together. And what we're going to see is there are two shouts. Each shout is explained by something. And there are two reactions. And we're going to go through this step by step. So let's look at the very first shout that comes at the beginning of verse 34, where Jesus cries with a loud voice and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And alongside that is the explanation of that shout as it's dark for three hours. Now, what is going on here? Well, we know exactly what Jesus shouted because we're told that in verse 34. My God, why have you forsaken me? What does he mean when he says that, that God has forsaken him? Well, Mark helps us to know by putting it together with the thing in verse 33. Darkness it explains what's going on. And darkness in the Bible represents God's judgment. It's a picture that gets used in lots and lots of places. On the day of judgment, it's going to be dark. Uh, when, when God sends all kinds of judgments in the Old Testament, it's connected to being dark. That's why when Jesus returns, it will be a dark day. The sun will not give its light. So what is happening here is that as Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it goes dark. We're give, being given a picture of Jesus experiencing God's judgment. One of the pictures that he uses in several places in Mark's gospel is the idea of drinking a cup. 
And in the Old Testament, that's a picture that is used for God's anger, that there is a cup full of God's anger that is going to be poured over the earth when God judges. And Jesus is saying, says, I'm going to take that cup and drink it. Drink down God's anger and his judgment at the sins of the world. And you could say that's exactly what he's doing here. Here at this moment, he drinks the cup of God's anger. Here at this moment, he experiences God's anger. The world goes dark. Jesus calls out, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was taking onto himself here God's judgment, his punishment as sin. It's falling onto Jesus as he died. And the picture is all the sins of the world are being focused on to Jesus. And all of God's anger at all the sins of the world are being focused on to Jesus. Little boys at school like to play with magnifying glasses. You know the kind of glasses, don't it? You call them magnifying glasses here? Yeah. Um, and you know how you, if you're a little boy, you can do lots of damage with a magnifying glass. You can focus all the rays of the sun down through your glass and make them go into a point. You can fry beetles, can't you? You can try and burn the back of the hand of your friend. I mean, do all kinds of horrible things. Because all of the rays of the sun, if you like, are focused down onto one point. And I think that's exactly what is going on here at the death of Jesus. All of God's anger at all of the sins of the world, the many millions, billions of sins of the world, have all been focused down into one point of terrifying intensity as God's anger burns itself into the head of the Lord Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the, wor the world goes dark. It isn't because God is angry at Jesus' sin. It's clear throughout the Gospels. It's clear through the Bible that he didn't sin. No, God is angry at our sin. And it is taken by the Lord Jesus instead of us. So that's the first shout and the first explanation that Jesus experiences the wrath or the anger of God. Let's go back to our, how the passage is all put together and look, look this time at the second shout, which comes in verse 37, and how that is explained to us in verse 38. So the second cry comes in verse 37, and this time Mark doesn't tell us what Jesus says. Uh, maybe it's one of the other cries where we know the words in another gospel. Today you'll be with me in paradise or it is finished. Uh, Mark doesn't tell us. The point is, this is his last cry, his last breath, and he dies. But what Mark does to help us understand what that cry means is he gives us verse 38 to explain it. When Jesus died... As he uttered his last cry, his last breath, what does that mean? Now look again to verse 38. And we are very used to this verse. But I want you to think how really odd it is. The whole of Mark's gospel has been leading up to this moment where Jesus dies. And he's, all of his story has been taking us there. He is making us look at the Lord Jesus, listen to the cries of Jesus. This is absolutely the climax of the whole story. And as if Mark says in the middle of the story, oh, I need to tell you about some of the curtains that there are in another building. Forget that for a minute. Let me tell you about the curtains over here. And then he comes back. He leaves the scene on the hillside and goes to another building, the temple, and tells us about the internal furnishings in that other building. Don't you think that's odd? Right at the death of Jesus. Why, why is he doing that? This is, this is a really big moment, Mark. I'm not interested in curtains. Tell us about Jesus. And I think the reason is that Mark is saying to us, what is going on as Jesus dies can be explained if you come with me to the temple. 
in London, um, we have some very posh clubs that you have to pay lots of money to belong to. And uh, they are very old-fashioned, and they work a bit like this. Anybody can go into the entrance lobby, but you can't go into the next bit of the building, the next room, unless you are a member or married to a member. They're only for men, these clubs. So men can go into the next, men who are members can go to the next bit with their wives. Uh, the bit beyond that, only men can go to. The women can't come. And the bit beyond that, right in the middle of the, uh, the temple, sorry, right, right in the middle of the club, the, bit, the room right in the middle, and you can only go into that if you are a member, is where members play billiards, snooker, pool, pool table right in the middle. So anybody can go into the first bit. Only uh, men and women who are members and their wives can go into the next bit. Only men can go into the next bit. Only members can go right into the middle. Now, the temple is a bit like that. You can, anybody can go to the first bit. Only Jews can go into the next bit. Only priests can go into the next bit. Only the high priest is allowed to go and play snooker or pool. <laughs> just go into the Holy of Holies. Anybody else has to just stay outside. And it's a whole series of no entry signs. You can come this far, but no further. Oh, you can come this far, but no further. You can come this far, but no further. And only the high priest can go right into the middle. And the curtain that's being talked about here is about that thick. So it's a big curtain, that thick. And it stands, it hangs between the bit where priests can go and the bit where only high priest can go. And he can only go there once a year. And of course, all of the temple is built up to say, you can't just wander into the presence of God. It's, it's not an easy thing to come into the presence of God. It's a difficult thing to come into God's presence. Until this moment, three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and there must have been a massive noise. I mean, imagine trying to tear a bit of curtain that's that thick. And it's going to be noisy. And if you're outside, you'd look up and see what was that noise. And at that moment, you would see right into the very center of the temple where God is said to dwell. And it's a very, very vivid way of saying, anybody can go in there now. Anybody. What's to stop you? You can just walk right into God's presence. What, me? Yes, you. Anybody can go in there. So all of those no entry signs have been ripped away. And here we have the explanation then of that final shout of Jesus, that the way to God is opened. Think of the significance. You see, God had chosen the temple to be his dwelling place on earth. Not actually where he dwelled, but a picture of his dwelling place on earth. And now I can simply walk in. Nothing's going to stop me. No gates, no guards, no barriers. I can just go straight in. And at the moment that Jesus cries, that way is opened up. And it's like a motorway, a huge, great trunk road. Anybody can just go straight in. And you'll see, look down again to verse 38, that Mark makes it clear that this is all linked with the last breath of Jesus. Do you see immediately before verse 38, Jesus breathed his last? And carrying in on verse 39, the centurion sees that Jesus breathed his last. The last breath of Jesus, in other words, the death of Jesus, the moment he died, his death opens up that way. So as we look at what these two cries mean and what this explanation is, we'll see that what we've got here is a very simple outline of what we believe as Christians, that Jesus was forsaken so that I can be forgiven. You see what's going on? Jesus cries out as he experiences God's wrath. He is forsaken by his Father. And the result of that is that I can just come straight into God's presence. He was forsaken, so I can be forgiven. This is wonderfully great 
for you and me access to almighty God and it is unbelievably costly for the Lord Jesus who gave his life so that a curtain could be torn so that I could come and know God now I also said that what we've got here are two reactions and the two reactions are these um And Mark says, if you would have been there, you would have heard these things. First of all, there is the reaction in verses 35 and 36 from Jewish people. And then in verse 39, there's a reaction from a non-Jew, a Roman soldier. Let's look at the first reaction in verses 35 to 36. And what this reaction is basically saying is, oh, what a shame. Poor Jesus. I wonder if I could help him a little bit. I'll go and get him a tablet. And see, perhaps he'd like a little drinky winky. Should we go and get him a drink? Perhaps that'll make him better. Maybe somebody could come and help him. Oh, poor Jesus. In the year 2000, uh, to celebrate the millennium in London, we had a huge exhibition. People paid lots of money and then had to queue a very long time to go and see this exhibition. It's supposed to be a celebration of everything in our world after 2,000 years. And one of the areas was called the Faith Zone, and it was talking about all the great world religions, and one was Christianity. And you could go and see an exhibition there about Christianity, and when you got to the description of Jesus... The little description of what he was said this. Jesus was a good teacher who died tragically young. That's what the world makes of Jesus. And of course, that's what really what they're saying. Oh, it's such a shame he died. So young. That's so much potential. Poor Jesus. 33. I mean, if he'd lived another 40 years, just think what he could have done. What a shame. The other action comes in verse 39. And this is the most extraordinary reaction. Because here is a professional soldier who will have seen many people die by crucifixion. This is a man who is a foreigner. He's one of the hated occupying forces. If you were making this up, you definitely wouldn't put this kind of a statement, a declaration onto the lips of this man. You hate him. Horrible. And what he actually meant when he said this, we can't be sure. Did he mean that he was saying Jesus was just great? Did he mean that he thought Jesus was like one of his gods? Is it a statement of clear faith? That he really was putting his trust in Jesus, we can't be sure. But what we are sure about, and Mark does this lots of times in his gospel, is he's saying the truth is now out. It's now public. This man gets it right. Now, what is it that he gets right? There's something quite extraordinary here, isn't it? To look at this man dying and say he's a truly great one. Don't you think that's extraordinary? I mean, to say that this man was the son of God at the end of Mark part one would make sense. You see his great power, you see him doing all miracles, and you think, he's a great one. But why would you say that when you see the death of Jesus? And Mark is saying this to us. If you can say this when you see this, then you've understood the gospel. If you can be standing looking at Jesus on the cross and say, he is the great one, then you've understood the gospel. If you can look at this scene which looks so shameful and weak and say, this is the glory of Jesus, then you've understood the gospel. If you can look at somebody abandoned by his father, forsaken by his father, and say, I am forgiven, 
then you've understood the gospel. So then two shouts that are explained to us and two reactions to it. See, an unbelieving world says to Jesus, do us another miracle and I'll believe in you. Perform something great and spectacular. That might persuade me. But what that is, is unbelief. What Jesus does is offer us himself on the cross. And the Christian looks at that and says, wow, thank you. Penal substitution, forsaken, forgiven. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we get to this point in the story, we cannot do anything but say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, King Jesus, that you came to give your life as a ransom for me. I'm standing alongside Barabbas, and yet I am set free whilst you are killed. I should be drinking the cup of God's wrath. All of his anger should be poured out on me, but it is poured out on you. I should be forsaken, but you are forsaken. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for what you have done for us. We praise you. May this truth be every day more precious than it was yesterday. That you have done the most extraordinary thing for us in our place. We praise you in your name. Amen.